Tonight, the Bush Center welcomes Dr. Rosaria Butterfield as our guest speaker. Dr. Butterfield earned her PhD from Ohio State University in English Literature in 1992 and served in the English Department in Women's Studies program at Syracuse University from 1992 to 2002, publishing a book and scholarly articles on feminist theory, queer theory, 19th century British literature. She received tenure in 1999, providentially the same year that Christ claimed her for his own. She is the author of The Secret Thoughts of an Unlikely Convert, An English Professor's Journey into Christian Faith. As I said, that book is available in the vestibule, and she will be available after our event for, uh, to sign the book. Rosaria lives in Durham, North Carolina, uh, with her husband, Kent, who is pastor of the First Reformed Presbyterian Church of Durham. Tonight, Dr. Butterfield will be lecturing on sexuality, identity, and the doctrine of repentance, my train wreck conversion. Dr. Butterfield's lecture will address questions such as, is sexual orientation a real category? Are people born gay? And do our feelings determine our identities? Our testimonies of God's grace reveal the inner landscape of the power of the Holy Spirit to change hearts and lives. Tonight's lectures, a lecture will talk about sin, grace, and change in both personal and doctrinal terms. Dr. Butterfield will discuss her former homosexuality, feminism, university culture, and gospel integrity that's shown through the lives of her Christian neighbors and friends. Ladies and gentlemen, will you please join me in welcoming Dr. Rosaria Butterfield. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You haven't heard me yet, though. Thank you. How do I tell you about my conversion to Christianity without making it sound like an alien abduction or a train wreck? Truth be told, it felt a little like both. The language normally used to describe this odd miracle does not work for me. I didn't read one of those tacky self-help books with a thin coating of Christian themes, examine my life against the tenets of the Bible the way one might hold up one car insurance policy against all others and cleanly and logically make a decision for Christ. While I did make choices along the path of this journey, they never felt logical, risk-free, or sane. Neither did I feel like the victim of an emotional earthquake and collapse gracefully into the arms of my Savior like a holy and sanctified Scarlet O'Hara, having been claimed by Christ's irresistible grace. Heretical as it may seem, Christ and Christianity seemed eminently resistible. My Christian life unfolded as I was just living my life, my normal life. In the normal course of life, questions emerged that exceeded my secular feminist worldview. These questions sat quietly in the crevices of my mind until I met a most unlikely friend, a Christian pastor. Had a pastor named Ken Smith not shared the gospel with me for years and years, over and over again, not in some used car salesman way, but in an organic, spontaneous, and compassionate way, those questions might still be lodged in the crevices of my mind, and I might never have met the most unlikely of friends, Jesus Christ himself. I was raised in the Catholic faith, and I attended predominantly liberal Catholic schools. My liberal Catholic all-girl high school discipled me in the life skills that I use today. I learned there to read deeply and well, to diagram a sentence before I tried to interpret it, and to look out for the unloved and draw them in. I had a heterosexual adolescence, or so I presumed. In college, I met my first boyfriend. It was a heady experience. At the same time, an undercurrent of longing inserted itself in my intense friendships with women. I didn't make much of this at first. 
From the age of 22 until 28, I continued to date men and at the same time feel a sense of longing and connection that simply toppled over the edges for my women friends. This repetitious sensibility rooted and grew. I simply preferred the company of women. In my late 20s, enhanced by feminist philosophy and LGBT political advocacy, my homosocial preference morphed into homosexuality. That shift was subtle, not blatant. My lesbian identity and my love for my LGBT community developed in sync with my lesbian sexual practice. Life finally came together for me and made sense. I studied Freud. I cheered that the DSM had long since removed homosexuality from its list of disorders, thus rendering homosexuality in the eyes of the world and the academy normal. With no prohibitions or constraints, by the time I graduated from Ohio State with my PhD in English literature and critical theory, I left the Buckeye State with my first lesbian partner. We moved to New York for me to begin a tenure-track position in the English department at Syracuse University. My life as a lesbian seemed normal. I considered it an enlightened, chosen path. Lesbianism felt like a cleaner and more moral choice. Always preferring symmetry to asymmetry, I believed I had found my real self. What happened to my Catholic training? I believed now that it was hogwash, hocus pocus, hooey. The name Jesus, which had rolled off my tongue in a little girl's prayers, then rolled off my back in college, now made me recoil in anger. As a professor of English and women's studies, I cared about morality, justice, and compassion. As a 19th century scholar, fervent for the worldviews of Freud, Hegel, Marx, and Darwin, I strove to stand with the disempowered. I valued morality. And my life at this time was happy and meaningful and full. My next lesbian partner and I shared many vital interests, AIDS activism, children's health and literacy, Golden Retriever Rescue, our Unitarian Universalist Church, just to name a few. It was hard to argue that she and I were anything but good citizens and caregivers. The LGBT community values hospitality and applies it with skill, sacrifice, and integrity. Indeed, I honed the hospitality gifts that I use today as a pastor's wife in my former queer community. I began researching the religious right and their politics of hatred against people like me. And to do this, I began reading the Bible while looking for some Bible scholar to help me wade through this complex book. I took note that the Bible was an engaging literary display of every genre and trope and type. It had edgy poetry, deep and complex philosophy, and compelling narrative stories. It also embodied a worldview that I hated. Sin, repentance, Sodom and Gomorrah, absurd. At this time, the Promise Keepers came to town and parked their little circus at the university. <laughs> On my war against stupid, I wrote an article published in the local newspaper. It was 1997. The article generated many rejoinders, so many that I kept a Xerox box on each side of my desk, one for hate mail and one for fan mail. One letter that I received, though, defied my filing system. It was from Ken Smith, the pastor of the Syracuse Reformed Presbyterian Church. It was a kind and inquiring letter. Ken didn't argue with my article, rather, he asked me to defend the presuppositions that undergirded it. In his letter, he shared his love for the Bible, his concern that college students were not reading the Bible as part of a literature curriculum, and he described Jesus as someone who had entered into history, not someone who emerged from it. I thought that was insane. I believed that people proceeded from history and are shaped for good or for ill by the culture that molds them. I didn't know how to respond to the letter, so I threw it away. And later that night, I fished it out of the department's recycling bin and 
put it back on my desk where it stared at me for a week, confronting me with the worldview divide that demanded a response. As a postmodern intellectual, I operated from a historical materialist worldview, but Christianity is a supernatural worldview. If I was going to understand how this book, the Bible, got so many people off track and how this man, Jesus, persuaded so many people to follow him, Ken's letter showed me that I needed to understand Christianity as a supernatural idea. At this point in my life, the category of the supernatural was reserved for Stephen King novels. With the letter, Ken initiated two years of bringing the church to me, a heathen. Oh, I had seen my share of Bible verses on placards at gay pride marches. That Christians who mocked me at gay pride day were happy that I and everyone I loved was going to hell was as clear as the sky is blue. But Ken's letter didn't mock. It engaged. So when he invited me to dinner at his house to discuss these matters more fully, I accepted. My motives at the time were clear. Surely this would be good for my research. But something else happened. Ken and his wife, Floy, and I became friends. They entered my world. They met my friends. We did book exchanges. We talked openly about sexuality and politics. They did not act as if such conversations were polluting them. They did not treat me like a blank slate. When we ate together, Ken prayed in a way that I had never heard before. His prayers were intimate, vulnerable. He repented of his sin in front of me. He thanked God for all things. Ken's God was holy and firm, yet full of mercy. Ken and Floy omitted two important steps in the rule book of how Christians should deal with a heathen like me on that first night that I had dinner with them. They did not share the gospel with me, and they did not invite me to church. Because of these omissions to the Christian rule book, as I had come to know it, that night when Ken extended his hand in friendship to me, I knew it was safe for me to close my hand in his. I started meeting with Ken and Floy regularly, reading the Bible in earnest with pen in hand and notebook in lap. I read the way a glutton devours. Slowly and over time, the Bible started to take on a life and a meaning that startled me. Some of my well-worn paradigms no longer stuck. I had to at least ponder the hermeneutical claim that this book was different from all the others because it was inspired by a holy God and inherently true and trustworthy. And this led me to go through the presuppositional truth claims to, just to check the math of the meaning here. And the logic claims went like this for me. Number one, if this was a book written by men who were inspired by the Holy Spirit, then its admonitions about sin were not what I had been calling them applied cultural phobia. Why? Well, because God's goodness, unrestrained by time, anticipates and guards against the ill treatment of people. And two, if God is the creator of all things, and if the Bible has his seal of truth and power, then the Bible had a right to interrogate my life and my culture, not the other way around. Even as a postmodern reader, I understood that the idea of authority can only depend on that which is higher than itself. Well, who is higher than God, I wondered. At a dinner gathering that my partner and I were hosting, my transgendered friend Jay cornered me in the kitchen. She put her large hand over mine and said, Rosaria, this Bible reading is changing you. I felt exposed. I felt like I was going to throw up. I collapsed in the chair and I exhaled. But Jackie, what if it's true? What if Jesus is a real and risen Lord? What if we are all in trouble? Jay exhaled deeply and sat down in the chair across from mine. Her eyes looked wise and she said, Rosaria, I was a Presbyterian minister for 15 years. I prayed that God would heal me, but he didn't. If you want, I will pray for you. The next day when I returned home from work, 
I found two large milk crates spilling over with theological books, Jay's books. She was giving them to me. In Calvin's Institutes, in the margins of the exposition of the Book of Romans, in Jay's handwriting was a warning, quote, watch Romans 1. This is where I will fall. And this is what Romans 1, 21 through 27 says. For even, they, even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and of four-footed animals and crawling creatures. Therefore, God gave them over in the lusts of their heart to impurity so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator. And for this reason, God gave them over to degrading passions for their women exchanged the natural function for that which is unnatural. Look at the verb clauses here did not honor God, did not give thanks, engaged in futile speculations, became fools, exchanged the incorruptible for the corruptible. God gives us over to our lusts, and when we look at the world through our lusts, we dishonor our bodies and we worship the world. This verse seemed to provide a haunting literary echo to Genesis 3, where Eve's desire to live independently of God's authority made perfect sense to me. If I were Eve, I would have done the same thing. And at the same time, Eve and then Adam's seemingly innocent sin served as the leverage for the whole world to come tumbling down, fierce and fast, bloody and brilliant. The two verses, one in Genesis and one in Romans, stood out as bookends of my life. Not just my life, that's the rub. Genesis 3 and Romans 1 stood out as the table of contents of what ails the world. Indeed, Romans 1 does not end by highlighting homosexuality as the worst and most extreme example of the sin of failing to give God glory for creating us. Here is where the passage finds its crescendo. Being filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful. And although they know the ordinance of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, they not only do the same, but also give hearty approval to those who practice them. Homosexuality then, at least according to the Bible, is not the end point of the problem for God or for the world, but it is presented here as one step in the journey. Homosexuality then is consequential, not causal. According to the Bible itself, homosexuality was not the root of all sin, not even the root of my sin. This stopped me in my tracks. Somehow, it was easier to hate the Bible when it squared off against me. But now that it was getting under my skin, it became a foe of a different kind. So I tried to toss the Bible and its teachings in the trash. I really tried. But Ken had become my friend, and he encouraged me to keep reading. And because I trusted him, I did. As I read and reread the Bible, I kept catching my wings in its daily embrace. I was fighting the idea that the Bible is inspired and inerrant, that is, that its meaning and purpose has a holy and supernatural authority that has protected it over the years of its canonicity, and that it is the repository of truth. How could a smart cookie like me believe or embrace these things? I didn't even believe in truth. I was a postmodernist. I believed in truth claims. I believed that the reader constructed the text, that a text's meaning found its power only in the reader's interpretation of it. 
Without a reader, a book is just paper and glue, I told my students over and over again. How could this one book lay claim to a birthright and progeny so different from all the others? That this book was supernatural was becoming more and more evident to me, and my hermeneutical bag of tricks had no system of containment for it. As I was reading and discussing these things with Ken, he pointed out to me that Jesus is the word made flesh, and that knowing Jesus demands embracing the Jesus of the Bible, the whole Bible, not just the Jesus of someone's imagination, even the places that took my life captive. And after years and years of this, something happened. The Bible got to be bigger inside me than I. It overflowed into my world. I fought against it with all my might. And then one Sunday morning, two years after I first met Ken and Floyd, and two years after I started reading the Bible for my research, I left the bed I shared with my lesbian partner, and an hour later, I sat in a pew at the Syracuse Reformed Presbyterian Church. I say this not to be lurid, but merely to remind us that we simply do not know the treacherous journey that other people take to get to church. Conspicuous of my appearance, I reminded myself that I came there to meet God, not to fit in. Ken was preaching through the Gospel of Matthew with its bewildering cast of characters and problems, unsuspecting folks separated unto the Gospel, seeds choked by the world, feeding thousands with some poor nameless kids bread and fish, and then Jesus' cutting question to impetuous Peter, do you still lack understanding? followed by Pastor Ken's steely blue eyes and a long pause before he turned this question to us. Congregation, did Christ ever say this to you? He said. That startled me. I thought sermons were just lectures. I didn't know he was going to start talking to us like that. But that was my question. That question was for me. Do I still lack understanding? And I had to wonder who was speaking there the man behind the pulpit or the God-man behind the foundation and redemption of his people. And the image that crashed like waves in a raging sea of me and everyone I love suffering in hell vomited into my consciousness and gripped me in its teeth, not primarily because we were gay, but because we were proud. We wanted to be autonomous. It was our hearts first. Our bodies followed. I got it. I heard it finally. I counted the costs, and I did not like the math. This was my crucible, and it is my crucible. If the Bible is true, I was dead. If the Bible is false, I am the biggest fool on earth. But God's promises rolled in like another round of waves into my world. And one Lord's Day, Ken was preaching on John 7:17. 7, if anyone wills to do God's will, he shall know concerning the doctrine. This verse exposed the quicksand in which my feet were stuck. I was a thinker. I was paid to read books and write about them. I expected that in all areas of my life, understanding came before obedience, not the other way around. I wanted God to show me on my terms why homosexuality was a sin. I wanted to be the judge, not the one being judged. Perhaps I thought, like Eve in the garden, I wanted to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil so that I could become and replace God. I wondered, hadn't I already done this? Hadn't we all? If my consciousness fell in Adam's sin, as the Bible purports, no wonder I couldn't think my way out of this quandary. This wasn't a game of thinking and a matching of wits. Could my heart, though, echo God's call for obedience? Could I, quote, will to do God's will, unquote, just this once? The stakes were so very high. They always are. But the verse promised understanding after obedience. I wrestled with the question, 
Did I really want to understand homosexuality from God's point of view, or did I just want to argue with him? I prayed that night that God would give me the willingness to obey before I understood. I prayed that God would make me a godly woman. I prayed that God would give me the faith to repent of my sin at its root. What is the root of my sin? I did not then and I do not now think that the root of homosexuality is homosexuality. How does one repent of a sin that doesn't feel like a sin at all, but feels like normal, not bothering another soul kind of life? How would I come to this place? What is the root of the sin of sexual identity? I was a jumble of emotions, but I prayed that the Lord would help me to see my life from his point of view. And the next morning, when I woke up and I looked in the mirror, I looked the same. But when I looked in the mirror of the Bible, I wondered, am I a lesbian or has this all been a case of mistaken identity? If Jesus could split the world asunder, divide the soul and the spirit, judge the thoughts and the intentions of the heart, could he make my true identity prevail? Who am I? Who will God have me to be? I still felt like a lesbian in body and heart. That, that is, I felt my real identity. But what is my true identity? The Bible makes clear that the real and the true have a troubled relationship on this side of eternity. For many people in the Bible, their true identity and calling comes only after a long struggle with God, with wilderness, and with dreams, and hopes, and plans. The Bible makes clear that my future and my calling always echo an attribute of God. Obedience constrains. It always mirrors suffering, as every selection implies a sacrifice. What is bigger, my lesbian identity and the feminist and postmodern worldview that fuels it, or God's authority over me and holy sovereignty over the world? Who is this Jesus? Did I know him? Did I still lack understanding? Could I trust him? And then, one ordinary day, I came to Jesus. No altar calls in a Reformed Presbyterian church, so no fanfare or manipulation. We were singing from Psalm 119, line 56. This has become mine because forever all thy precepts I preserve. After I sang these words, something shifted. Two weight-bearing walls collapsed in my mind. The first wall came crashing down because I had just sung condemnation unto myself, and I knew it. This Bible was not mine. I had scorned it and cursed it and despised it. But I had been reading and rereading this book, and the use of the helping verb here, has, and has become, troubled me. Two years of laborious reading embodies the helping verb, has. It showed process, journey, pilgrimage, and danger. But I was not, quote unquote, in Christ, and therefore could not possibly keep those precepts in word, heart change, or deed. And here was the shattering of the second wall. I had read the Bible many times through, and I saw for myself that it had a holy author. I saw for myself that it was a canonized collection of 66 books with a unified biblical revelation. I heard for myself that when the words, this has become mine, came out of my mouth in congregational singing, I was attesting to this one simple truth, that the line of communication that God ordained for his people required this wrestling with scripture and that I truly wanted to both hear God's voice breathed into my life and I wanted God to hear my prayers. The fog burned away. The whole Bible, each jot and tittle, was my open highway to a holy God. My hands let go of the wheel of self-invention. I came to Jesus alone, open-handed and naked. 
I had no dignity upon which to stand. It was a crushing revelation. It was Jesus I had been persecuting the whole time. And in this war of worldviews, Ken and Floyd were there. The church who had been praying for me for years in the background, quietly, they were there. Jesus triumphed, and I was a broken mess. I lost everything but the dog. And he was a good dog. But he's dead now, so that's another story. So now he's a good dead dog. But I'm gonna go on. Of course, there's only one thing to do when you meet the living God. You must fall on your face and repent of your sins. And repentance is bittersweet business. Repentance is not just some conversion exercise. It is the posture of the Christian, much like tree or full lotus is the posture of the yogi. Repentance is our daily fruit, our hourly washing, our minute by minute wake up call, our reminder of God's creation, Jesus' blood, and the Holy Spirit's comfort. Repentance is the only no shame solution to a renewed Christian conscience because all it does is prove the obvious, that God was right all along. I speak today about matters that happened over a decade ago. God has taken me on a long journey, and like most pilgrimages, mine tends to engender more questions than answers. So in the time we have left, I want to take up one question about sexuality and the Christian faith that I am repeatedly asked. Why did I have to give up my girlfriend for Christ? Why couldn't I have both? After all, can't someone believe in Jesus and be gay? So let's unpack this. Number one, can someone struggle with homoerotic attraction and be a faithful believer in Christ's atoning work? Yes. Yes, people can struggle with every sin of every branch and stripe. But can someone unrepentingly embrace and deny as sin homoerotic lust, allowing it to flourish and root as a practice and an identity, and then add Jesus to this identity and call it the Christian faith? No. Why no? Why isn't this no an example of homophobia and its rejection of the idea that the individual sets the terms of her own sexual identity? What about people whose gender identity is clearly liminal or people who perceive themselves to be born with a deep and abiding and unrelenting sense of gay identity and selfhood. Because the Bible is sufficient for how we understand sexuality and how we mortify sin, we do not need to add anything to it when seeking help. It is simple and difficult all at the same time. We indeed are all quote unquote born this way, although what this references may be different. We are all in the same boat. Salvation begins with God's sovereign initiation, not with my intellectual assent to a moral framework about normative sexuality or a set of ideas or a desire to get rich or have a happy life. It is a dangerous lie to say that Christians are people who merely believe in Jesus. Even the demons believed in Jesus, and it sent them straight to hell. Of course, lies are called half-truths for a reason. Dangerous ideas often contain large dollops of truth. The idea that a Christian is merely someone who believes in Jesus, though, is the whopper deception of this present age. After God's sovereign invitation, after the Holy Spirit removes the heart of stone and replaces it with a heart of flesh, we fall on our faces as we hear the still, small voice of God. We relinquish our lives to him as his sovereign grace commands this. We relinquish all of it, and we keep nothing back. This includes our sexuality. We were born this way. 
We were all born this way, and this is what it means to have Adam as our representative head, to have fallen with Adam in his first sin, and to be born with original sin. So how do we hear God? Is it an audible voice? No. God speaks to us through the language of the Bible. The Bible is key. We train our ears to hear the Lord by drinking deeply of his holy word, his word, his direct word, not the themes of Christianity that we create in personal artwork or dance. Nothing that we create will have the power to save, discern, or sanctify. Not one creation of ours will even come close to the sharp edges and the sanctifying blood of our Savior. We commit our lives to the Jesus of the Bible, the Word made flesh, who came to fulfill the whole law, every jot and tittle, and we do not use our own personal experience to verify the validity of God's commands. The Christian faith is simply not a pragmatist's paradigm. We die to the old man or woman, and we become alive in Christ, or we do not know him. He is the potter, we are the clay. In sanctification, we synergistically work with God to grow in a likeness of Jesus by drinking deeply of the means of grace, Bible reading, psalm singing, worship, taking the sacraments, church membership, fellowship with other believers, the perseverance of the saints. In so doing, we take our rightful place as sons and daughters of the covenant. We do not look to ourselves to see if we measure up because we do not. We look to Christ. When Jesus died and rose again, he gave sin a mortal blow. Thomas Brooks compares our sin to a tree that has been cut at the root. The tree may pop a few leaves, but its inevitable fate is death. And so too we see our sin. It no longer comes at us with full potency. It is a snake or a lion with its jaw wired shut. Sin may sucker punch us, but never slay us because Christ's death gave sin its inevitable death. If you are in Christ, you are daily growing in sanctification. That is how Christ heals us from the consequence of our sin, whatever that sin may be, by giving us daily victory over it, by never divorcing us even when we fall and are weak, and by giving himself to us as an example. Christ did not die all at once upon the cross, so also the slaying of sin is gradual in the souls of saints, says Thomas Brooks. Sexual sin has many tendrils, but by Christ's stripes we are healed. He pours the supernatural balm of Christian victory into the grooves of our sin patterns, our body memories, until the holes are filled with his grace and until attacks and seductions no longer stop us in our tracks. And that is what it means to be a new creature in Christ. God separates us unto the gospel to reveal his son in us. Recognizing that God gave us our will, we put our will on his altar. We use God's vocabulary and God's dictionary. We call sin, sin no matter what our personal feelings or experiences or simply how good it feels. We call grace, grace, and we drink deeply from its well. We are God's image bearers, and we encourage other image bearers to spend more time looking at the original than at the reflection. We do not domesticate sin by calling it something else. So this question, it is a persistent question for our times. Can a person retain an unrepentingly gay personal identity and claim Christ's headship, lordship, and salvation? Indeed, that is what the, the Raleigh-based advocacy group, the Gay Christian Network, wants you to believe. Other well-known Christians are calling themselves gay Christians as well. Who are we to argue with the use of a descriptive adjective like gay to modify the noun Christian? Does it matter? And this is a rhetorical question because as an English professor, I always think these kinds of things matter. Does it matter that the linguistic purpose of a descriptive adjective 
is to actually indicate the quality of the noun that it modifies? These are not small matters. What is in a word, you might ask? Everything. Jesus is the word made flesh. All power is in the word. Christ will have all of us, not part of us. We may struggle with all manner of sin and temptation in this world. Nowhere in the Bible is there a recorded prayer where anyone gets to order up his own personal program for sanctification. As Oswald Chambers puts it, sanctification is not my idea of what I want God to do for me. Sanctification is God's idea of what he wants to do for me. So, What is the Christian response to our family and our friends in the LGBT community? Let's turn to Ephesians 1, three through five. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Just as he, the Father, chose us in him, the Son, before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him In love, he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will. Recently, someone said this to me, Rosaria, give up this ministry. It is dangerous and unnecessary, and those people are going straight to hell anyway. But, I believe that God's elect people are in the gay and lesbian community too. And that changes everything. Ezekiel 37.3 puts it in terms of a question. Son of man, can these bones live? What about my bones or, or your bones? Were they somehow less dead? Do we remember the humbling moment when we first knocked at God's door standing there, the crucified thief. To this you might say, Rosaria, if God's elect people are in the gay and lesbian community, why aren't they rushing into our churches saying, how can we be saved? Why instead do we see whole branches of the Christian faith rejecting orthodoxy for revisionism, domesticating the sin of homosexuality, and declaring a false peace? Dear Christian, is it possible that we are perhaps in no small part to blame? Homosexuality is a sin, but so too is homophobia. And what is homophobia? It's the unrestrained fear of gay and lesbian people and the wholesale writing off of their souls. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Familiar passage, no temptation has overcome you, but such that is common to man, and God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will provide the way of escape also, so that you will be able to endure it. Now think about this. What if the way of escape for our brothers and sisters in the LGBT community is your house or mine, your church, or mine? Are we too busy? Are we too scared? Are we part of the problem or the solution? Are we good company for the suffering? Do we secretly harbor the heresy that people's world-defined identities overpower God's imprint of his soul upon us? Are we willing to speak the truth in love across the long haul of unconditional friendship? Do we not want to rock the boat with gospel truth? Or do we only want to rock the boat, reducing people who do not yet know Christ to stereotypes, to mock and despise? Are we afraid of breaking our hearts on the rock of Christ as we shake the gates of heaven in prayer? God's journey for me has been rigorous, and my former life while under the blood can still lurk at times in the edges of my heart. God changed my heart's desires, but memories, while dulling, have not disappeared. I pray for the names from my past that intrude into my present at unpredictable times. God saved me, but he did not lobotomize me. But bigger than this, 
I have not forgotten the blood that Jesus surrendered for this life, this very one, where today I live in the shelter of a covenant family, where one calls me wife and many call me mother, this precious, never imagined jewel of a life in Christ Jesus, my Lord and my Savior, a life whose edges only pale because in Christ so much more awaits me and so much more is promised. Thank you. We have time for a few questions. What we're going to do is we have a microphone on this side and we have a microphone here. Uh, who's going to help me with the microphone? Is, okay. So what we'll do is, and if you in the balcony have a question, uh, we do have a, uh, we have a microphone in the balcony. Well, great. If you would, if you have a question, would you please stand uh, at the time when we take a question, and that way we can give you an opportunity to speak your question into the microphone, and that way uh, we are video recording uh, this event. That way we can have the question recorded along with Rosaria's uh, answer. So what questions would we have for her tonight that you might want to ask and her talk brought to your mind? Over here. Thank you for your presentation. Um, in recently discovering the Gay Christian Network and looking at a lot of the videos mm -hmm. that they offer there and um, some seemingly strong and compelling arguments that they mm -hmm. give and just thinking through those things and trying to be proactive as a minister. Um, one of the things that struck me specifically on one of those videos was their interpretation of the Sodom and Gomorrah. Right, um, yeah. It's just, I know you're familiar with that. Could you just speak to that? Um, yeah, yeah. Well, there are a couple of things. I mean, th these, at any time people speak from a personal experience, it's a compelling argument, right? Because who are we to deny that one person's broken leg hurts more or less. I mean, it, it, it becomes an argument that, we, that, that stymies us and, and stops us. But ultimately, the, um, the hermeneutic that the Gay Christian Network uses, if you've read um, uh, Justin's book, he makes a, a statement flat out that the Old Testament cannot be trusted. Um, he says that uh, in the same way that uh, women wear scarves like this one with wool and cotton, um, you know, if, if, you know if, we, if we do this, how can we trust that homosexuality is a sin? He, he makes a reference that, uh, you know, anybody in any, um, you know, Sunday school classroom knows that these are just stories that are no longer relevant. So I would say one of the first things that, that we all need to do is shore up a much um, firmer hermeneutical, uh, God-honoring approach to the Old Testament. If we ourselves do not know how to separate the moral law from the judicial law, from the ceremonial law, we will have a very hard time making a case for, for why some things are still relevant and other things went out with temple worship. It's, it's a simple argument, but if we don't know it, how in the world can we communicate it? Uh, but ultimately, I would say the biggest problem with um, almost all of the Old Testament readings is the way they affect the New Testament promise of resurrection. And I think what we're dealing with with the Gay Christian Network is modern day Sadducees. I really do, because the Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection, right? They didn't. And the Gay Christian Network does not believe that in the resurrection you are a changed person. And so I think that we need to be in a posture of being ready to disciple our brothers and sisters in the, in the Gay Christian Network because God's elect people are everywhere. And, and for a wide variety of reasons, um, we, are, we are all often imperfectly discipled. So I think that the way to deal with, 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 with this situation is to prayerfully be better students of the Old Testament ourselves, 
so that we can be firmer and more fervent in our absolute um, understanding of the power of the resurrection and its, its power to change lives and hearts of all stripes. Does that answer your question? I had a question down here at the front. Hello, ma'am. Um, I have Speak two friends who are practicing homosexuals. I'm, I'm sorry? I have two friends who are practicing homosexuals. One of them um, dealt with homosexuality in college. I came to know Christ personally and for 20 years was a celibate minister. Mm -hmm. And then he had a series of things go wrong in his life, had something of a breakdown and gave up that celibacy. Mm -hmm. My other friend um, grew up struggling with homosexual, homosexuality, didn't discuss it with anyone. Um, very conservative Christian, went to college, then went to work in DC, went through a program similar to Exodus that claimed to cure homosexuality. Mm -hmm. Their final piece of advice to him was to go out and get married so it would stick. A year later, he was married to a woman. Three years later, he was divorced. Yeah. And yeah. now he has a boyfriend. Yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. And they're both, on all instances besides sexuality, right. they're still tremendously conservative. They're pro-life, they right. believe the scriptures, they just choose to interpret the verses on sexuality differently. How do we deal with people who have spent the majority of their life bearing fruit for Christ, right, right. but have given, given into that temptation? Right. Those are good questions and hard questions, aren't they? Uh, well, first of all, we, we deal with people respectfully. We deal with people respectfully, and we recognize that it is not just our friends who have fallen back into a sin pattern that they had been resisting who struggle. We, we all struggle, and, and we all struggle with indwelling sin, and that's the sin that calls us by name, that we feel is as close to us as anything else, um, and that truly the only thing that, that allows us to call it sin is a knowledge that, that, um, that the only reason that sin is sin is that it displeases God. Sin often pleases us very much. That's part of why we fall. But one of the challenges, and it is not just, you know, you mentioned Exodus, uh, you know, that is a very sad situation. I, 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 um, I firmly believe that as a Christ-loving culture, one of the best things we can do right now is to reread John Owen and to have a much firmer understanding of how to mortify sin in a daily way. You know, what's happened is that we, in the broad Christian community, have a very sloppy understanding of sin. We, we act as though, you know, well, we, you know, if we repented of our sin when we committed our life to Christ and, you know, June 1st, 1970, whoo, you know, done with that, and, and it's all fine. And that's just, that is, that is the most dangerous idea. Um, so sin is as God tells us in the book of Genesis, right? Genesis 4, he says to Cain, sin is lurking at your door. Its desire is for you, but you shall have mastery over it. Well, how? How do we have mastery over it if we can't really talk to each other honestly about the sin that we're struggling with because we're afraid of what our church would say? Um, you know, and that's a ter I think it's a terrible thing to use um, to use heterosexual marriage as a, some, some kind of a curative, the, the sexuality that makes up the sin of homosexuality or the sin of pornography or the sin of masturbation is a totally different, a totally different sexuality than the sexuality that makes up a heterosexual marriage. It's simply a different beast entirely, and so I think it's, it's irresponsible to, to recommend that. But one of the things that we can do and one of the things we have to do is to come up alongside our brothers and our sisters who have fallen and to remember that no matter how ugly it looks, we do not know the hearts of, of people. Now, I think that a, a bad theology makes it very hard to repent of sin. See, because if I don't say, if I say, no, this isn't really sin, this is just how God made me, then I've taken myself out of the game entirely. 
So I would say that what the best thing that we can do is to stay very close to our friends, to not disown our friends because they hold a theology that we know is not biblical and not God-honoring, and at the same time to shore ourselves up in a firmer understanding of the power of indwelling sin. And I strongly recommend John Owen. I don't know, I don't know that anybody's really reading or rereading him anymore, but I think that you know, he's the man for our times. And, and I strongly recommend it. Uh, so my question's a little bit specific, but hopefully there'll be some more broader implications for people. I'm in an online degree program, and one of the courses that I'm required to take that I'm enrolled in this semester is Women and Gender Studies. Okay. And so it's all online, so I can't meet these people, but I want to know in what ways can I maintain gospel integrity without just debating these issues? Because most of them will be very postmodern, mm -hmm. not coming from the Christian worldview. So what right. can I do in our forums and in our discussions that right. will be maintain that integrity without? Right. Yeah, yeah, those are good questions. You know, anytime you are taking a class in a field that is really outside of your worldview, you're in enemy territory, right? And so there you are, a pilgrim and a missionary, uh, right? And it's dangerous, and you know that. And I think debating is probably not a, not a great idea. I think it helps to know what the boundaries are for this particular class. What, uh, you know, if you support your evidence from, um, from scholarship, do you get to say what you want? So I think you need to clarify from the very beginning what the ground rules are and go through it prayerfully and pray for your teachers. And, um, um, you know, but yeah, you're in, you're, you're in, you're in shark water. <laughs> I don't know what else to say. Yeah. Yeah, you are. You are. I completely, I, I know it, right? Because that's, that's, yeah. But you know what? If God calls you to be swimming in shark water, what do you do? You know, don't waste your stoning. That's what you do. Uh, you don't just avoid it because it's dangerous. It's absolutely dangerous. Go in with your eyes open prayerfully. Other questions? One here. Um, my question is, anybody who has struggled with homosexuality and has come from it, or maybe even with your own personal experience, what would you recommend to them um, in administering to other people who struggle with homosexuality? Um, I mean, how how like, do you, as a Christian... Well, sh I'm, I should say in a sense of like protecting the fact that, because if you're ministering to somebody who's homosexual when you come from that or something like that. Oh, okay. okay. So has there ever been like even a personal struggle witnessing to like Got other it. women? Or okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good question. That's a very good question. Um, you know, one of the things that I am really thankful for is that in the body of Christ, there are no lone rangers. And so one of the most important things that, you, that we all need to do is to daily mortify our sin and to be mindful of what that sin is, to call it sin. Um, you know, if you don't know what your sin is, just ask somebody who knows you really well, right? I mean, it's not, I hate to say it, it's really not that big of a mystery, right, you know? Um, and, to, and just to be mindful of that. But no, I, I think one of, the, one of the real dangerous things, you know, ultimately God calls us to himself so that we could worship him. What is the, the fruit of our Christian life is not how many people we, we, we quote unquote bring to Christ, how many uh, Christian programs we do, how many times we share the gospel that week, but the ultimate um, fruit of the Christian life is the integrity of your relationship with Jesus. So if you ever feel indispensable in ministry, fall on your face hard because that is the ultimate traitorship. Um, so if God brings you ministry, you respond, but you do not privatize your work. Does that make sense? So that you are always accountable um, and you are always ministering in the body. But you know what? If something is really tempting and you know it, then don't go there. Okay, it's very simple. You are told to flee from sin. 
not debate it, not discuss it, not, um, uh, you know, ask 47 of your closest friends to, uh, you know, assert whether or not you're a good whatever counselor on this subject. So do not think so highly of yourself uh, to presume that God needs you to do anything. God doesn't need me or you to do anything. But by, by, by God's grace, we get to have a relationship with him. Um, so I don't think anyone should be ministering alone or um, without, a, without a, a fairly full window. Does that answer your question? Dr. Butterfield, you have presented tonight in a way that uh, was articulate, insightful, and winsome, and I am deeply appreciative of, of you, you and uh, your testimony and, and the way that you have presented yourself. I would want to ask all of you to join me one more time in showing our appreciation to Dr. Butterfield. <laughs>